awesome. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, to coming. Uh, I hope you guys will enjoy my presentation. So let's discuss how I spent about 10 to 15 years uh, from my childhood to my teenagehood learning to become an artist. So I learned how to paint acrylics, oil paints, watercolor, charcoal, anything and everything. Um, I completed high school and had an, a full ride scholarship to attend a fine arts university. Uh, but that was almost a decade ago, I think. And you may be wondering to yourself, why is this artist here at a technical conference? My name is Jam. You may also know me as V if you're in the CTF space. Whichever one you like, Jam or V, it doesn't matter. I like either. Um, I started learning about computer security and cybersecurity in 2020, which is only about four years ago. Um, and I came from a relatively strict artistic background. And in spite of that, I think I've achieved, I've achieved quite a few things in the security space. And I'd like to talk about those things today. So the agenda moving forward for this talk, I'll talk a little bit more about my story, maybe uh, give a little bit more context into my artistry, and then I'm gonna discuss some techniques I've learned in a CTF context, and then transfer them in a red team context. And finally, some closing lessons and takeaways, and of course, uh, some time for Q&A. So like I said before, I spent about one and a half decades towards an illustration-based career. Uh, most of my high school was about fine art and art history, anything creative. I didn't really learn much about computers at this time. But I do remember a specific turning point when I graduated from high school and was preparing to go into university, where I felt a greater desire to participate in something with more intensity, more action, more stuff to do, I guess. So after my high school graduation, uh, I tried to go into esports, and that didn't really work out. Um, I kind of spiraled into playing Super Smash Brothers and other fighting games as often as I could, but clearly that didn't happen. So that's OK. I settled into designing and making video games over playing video games competitively, although I still had a competitive itch that needed to be scratched. And it was at this time I was attending UBC, pursuing STEM to make video games, and was chatting with a friend of mine. Um, with this friend, I was complaining about this competitive spirit that I wanted to satisfy, and the conversation went a little bit like this. Yeah, I would go back to playing fighting games, but I can't really focus on my studies at the same time. I kind of need something to focus on that's competitive, but also in line with what I'm studying. Like DEF CON CTF? CTF capture the flag competitions? What? Yeah, yeah, competitive hacking. You know, security, hacking, exploiting things, bugs. Le legally? Well, yeah, anyway. So, it sounded really interesting, and I guess I could give it a shot. So I decided to check out CTFs, capture the flag competitions, and I came across a little team called Maple Bacon, the CTF team at the University of British Columbia, or UBC. And at the time, Maple Bacon was roughly about a year old when I joined its ranks in 2020. Uh, it started in early 2019. And I didn't know enough about security on my own, and Maple Bacon was small enough at the time that it didn't feel too intimidating to start this new hobby. But 2020 is not really the best time to be joining a new club and doing in-person activities, for whatever reason. And the height of the pandemic really threw the stability of that team into question. So at the time, I did what any novice newcomer would do uh, and assumed complete administrative and team leadership of the club for a few years until I graduated, which was from the span of 2020 to 2022. Those three years had a lot of different milestones going on. Number one, we became the number one CTF team in all of Canada in all of three years, 2020, 2021, 2022. We organized a few of our own CTFs and soon put UBC on the map for learning about cybersecurity, which, I'm, which is something I'm really, really proud of. 
but one of the more prominent achievements of ours was a joint collaboration with fellow CTF teams, Plaid Parliament of, Plaid Parliament of Poning and The Duck, to create the team Maple Mallard Magistrates. We had a lot of fun with the name. <laughs> to create the team Maple Mallard Magistrates and winning DEF CON CTF 2022, and also winning DEF CON CTF 2023. I have the black badge to prove it. I'm actually in this photo. I am behind Dark Tangent, who's sitting down. Um, and in spite of that, I am still quite short, and you can't see all of me. Uh, but I'm there. So that leaves me to today. Shortly after graduating UBC, I became a security engineer at Google Red Team. And looking back at my progress now, I noticed that there was a bit of a pattern that I picked up, which helped me in all sorts of different contexts. There's a lot of ways to start a security journey. My way is just one of them. But I'm hoping to showcase this pattern to help others get creative with their own security journeys. For those of you wondering, don't worry. I didn't completely give up on my artistic skill sets. I'm still an artist at heart. And I even managed to sneak some of my artistic skills in my job, uh, such as designing the art for Hexcelerate 2023 last year. These are some of my illustrations. I hope you like them. Great. So. Let's actually get started, and first let's establish some terms. So if you don't know what CTFs are, or capture the flag competitions, uh, these are just competitive hacking competitions. You are given a challenge, usually some sort of small application or a service, uh, with some sort of vulnerability baked into it. Uh, it's your job to find that vulnerability, exploit that vulnerability, and get a flag, capture the flag, to show for it. Red teams, on the other hand, uh, red teams conduct exercises targeting the organization and collecting the data of the tax they were able to pull off, compiling it into a report to improve the organization's security controls. So you can see that red teams are um, a lot more coordinated, have a lot larger scope than CTFs, but there's certainly overlap between the two, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But before I do, uh, I do want to discuss what's in scope and not in scope. Naturally, CTFs and red teams and the principles regarding both, I'll happily talk about those. But things like bug bounties and security certificates, I won't really be talking about here, simply because I don't consider myself an expert in either of those two things. Uh, if you like them and if you've tried them out, great. OK, so before um, we got into some of these tips and tricks. I think perhaps a question that some of you may be wondering is, uh, how does one win DEF CON CTF? Uh, which is a difficult question to answer. Uh, so besides obvious technical answers, like determining what tools to use, team roles to fill, it's not really a question that can solely be answered by me, because I didn't win the CTF on my own. My team won it, you know, aka it was a team effort. Um, so right now, I can't answer this question, but I will come back to it in a second. Let's actually have a chat about learning how to play in CTFs and answer the question that every security engineer has been wondering to themselves, what is art? <laughs> so how do you become an artist? I had a high school art teacher who gave me a very effective yet simple algorithm for becoming a good artist and making great art. So it looks like this. It's a three-step strategy, and you start with your flow of the creative medium. Basically, this means determine what mediums you're using in your painting. You need to treat, for example, oil paints and acrylic paints differently from each other. They offer different things, and how you use them and where you use them opens all sorts of different techniques that you can use, which leads to the second point, employing techniques. Certain techniques you use in a watercolor painting don't translate very well in an acrylic painting, but when you figure out what your medium is and how to use it and where to use it, then you can determine what sorts of techniques make the most sense to use. And at that point, you can innovate, which is once you've learned your basics, then you can do cool and unique things, and this is where you learn the rules in order to break the rules. Is, is that a question? What's up? No. 
That's okay. Fantastic question. It turns out that this algorithm given to me by my art teacher serves me very well in different contexts. Uh, change a few details, and you end up with a pretty nice strategy for solving CTF challenges, determining the best vulnerabilities to find, and also even conducting red team exercises. <laughs> Another side note, though, um, one thing about being an artist, I think it gives me a really good eye for uh, UI and UX design. I like to think that I'm really good at creative design and other um, facets of animation and, uh, you know, things like that. Transition. So after enough abstraction, you can place this algorithm in a new context fairly easily. So instead of flow of the creative medium, you have user input. Like art mediums, where user input where your user input comes from and where it goes determines how an application can be exploited. However it's processed will open up an array of potential techniques to use. And speaking of techniques, once you've figured out which exploits you can weaponize, you ask the most important question, which is to validate an assumption an application is making and then contradict it. The crux of the vulnerability lies in the assumptions made during the implementation of your application. So let's start with the first bullet point, <clears throat> user input. This comes to an application in a variety of ways. This is not an exhaustive list. But it's important to call it out here and establish that most vulnerabilities start with an app processing a really weird piece of external data. But since user input can come from anywhere, in the client side, in HTTP cookies, and the requests and URLs, it contextualizes what techniques you would likely be using. So for example, let's say that you have a website, web.site, that logs the requests that are made to it daily. It's just a typical flow of a piece of data provided by the user. It might look like this. You have a website. It processes query parameters provided in the URL. In this case, it's bar. Maybe it goes to one hop by a bash script. And that bash script is supposed to be generating logs for your server. It'll inject the value of the query into the command that creates the logs, and then afterwards, perhaps it's processed by a Python server, which serializes the query using a native module called pickle in order to standardize the value into some sort of agreeable format for further processing down the road. Then let's say it's given back to the browser, and therefore the user, and rendered into the HTML of the document. So I've intentionally highlighted only the bits and pieces of the code that are relevant for user input. Sometimes it takes a little bit of practice to see why these bits and pieces of code are vulnerable. Uh, however, I do believe some of you can already see some glaring issues with these, piece, with these pieces of code. But what matters here is that user input almost always precludes a vulnerability. And it just takes some time recognizing why that vulnerability is a vulnerability in the first place. Moving on to technique. So you have your user input, and you're tracing where it goes in the application. Now is the time to determine how to weaponize that user input into something useful, into a technique for you to capitalize on. You can see in this flowchart here <laughs> that the context of where the user input is is going to inform what techniques will be available to you. For example, if you have user input processed in a PHP server, it doesn't really make sense to be looking for prototype pollution vulnerabilities because that's something more common in JavaScript servers. Note that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and to be fair, while a handful of the vulnerabilities here only make sense under the context I put them in, under, others are agnostic and can occur in other contexts. For example, deserialization is not just limited to JavaScript servers, and uh, parsing errors are certainly not limited to just JavaScript servers. But once you've figured out your technique, now you can contradict an assumption. You have, an, you have a potential array of techniques to research and manipulate your user input to weaponize. Now you have to think about what sorts of assumptions the application is making and how you can contradict them. So last year, last year's Google CTF, I made a CTF challenge that involved creating a type confusion in a web server built in TypeScript. The application made the assumption that the type of data, so integer, string, array, that type would be checked and validated at runtime. They weren't. 
Therefore, no additional checks of the types occurred in the code, allowing you to do all sorts of things. Confusing your types and achieving maybe a DOS in the worst case and RCE, or sorry, a DOS in the best case and RCE in the worst case. CTF challenges, they tend to grow in complexity the more assumptions the author wants you to challenge and create chains of exploits to demonstrate. As soon as you can model these out while you solve a CTF challenge, you'll have a pretty clear goal of what to look for in your next CTF encounter. Unfortunately, we don't have the whole day, uh, so I would have loved to go through every generalized assumption that I've seen made in CTF challenges, uh, but right now I'll just go through some favorites of mine for now. First one being that immutable objects are mutable, actually. It's this idea that there are certain objects or variables or whatnot that are considered static, immutable, or otherwise unchanging uh, when they are, in fact, changing quite often. My favorite example of this is a vulnerability in JavaScript, which I'll explain with an analogy. Let's say we have a robot factory that creates robot products based on some template. This template precludes every single ro robot product that we offer. So what would happen if we accidentally changed something about that template in the middle of the manufacturing process? We would suddenly have very different robot products as a result. Therefore, this template probably shouldn't change during the manufacturing process, but you know, sometimes mistakes happen. In JavaScript, all objects inherit from a prototype that gives it some base set of properties and methods. That prototype technically shouldn't be altered at all, but it turns out it can be. This is known as a vulnerability called prototype pollution, and its core premise is a violation of the assumption that certain things in code never change. Prototypes in JavaScript definitely change. This is the vulnerability in the function called flat, just over there. What makes prototype pollution so dangerous is it allows us to give all objects any property that we want. So at the bottom of the snippet of code, you'll see two objects, admin and v. You'll notice that v doesn't have the is admin property, um, but if we had prototype pollution, we could have injected it anyway by modifying the prototype of that object, inadvertently giving v admin status. The is admin property in this case is called a gadget here, as it's a snippet of code that lets us achieve different things using this vulnerability. Anyway, it's a good thing that JavaScript doesn't do this that often, though. That would be pretty bad. It would be really bad, actually, if there was like some sort of design pattern or something that made passing objects around and accessing their properties commonplace. Good thing uh, JavaScript doesn't do that. Anyway, so another assumption to think about is to contradict the idea that a piece of data looks the same to everything that perceives it. Parser differentials exist everywhere on the internet. As the web grows and evolves, the more and more parsers and frameworks and servers will come into existence, and it's important that they agree on certain standards for processing data. So take this example. We have a curl command, and let's say that um, our website from before is here, and I'm currently giving it two headers. Well, actually, I'm giving it one header, but with two duplicate values, foo and bar. So what should web.site see as the value for xv header? I'd like some audience participation. Who thinks, a show of hands, who thinks that the value should be just foo? <laughs> OK. And who thinks the value should be just bar? Okay. All right. And who thinks the value should be both, foo and bar? Great. OK. So uh, for those of you who voted both, foo and bar, you are correct. Congratulations. Uh, unfortunately, for those of you who voted either foo or either bar, just one of the two values, you're unfortunately also correct. Um, it just depends on what framework that I've used uh, for web.site. You'll notice here that the problem is pretty apparent when you scale up and create multiple servers under multiple frameworks. So maybe Node.js Express and Ruby on Rails and Python Flask, maybe they do all see the same duplicate values, but are they the same type even? Are those all strings or is one of them an array? This is actually um, 
based on a bug that I found in the wild. There was a parser differential in the way that two servers were interpreting the same header if you gave it multiple values. And in a case like this, using a random header like XV header, maybe the issue isn't that bad. But let's say that you use a, perhaps a more important header like X forwarded for, which can potentially modify other properties of the request. Suddenly, it starts to become very worrying that certain servers and frameworks aren't agreeing with each other. So those are just two, uh, some assumptions that I've, uh, I've seen when I was uh, looking at CTF challenges and also out in the wild. Um, there's a plenty more. This is definitely not an uh, exhaustive uh, e list of examples, but I hope that this kind of communicates the idea that CTFs are essentially all about contradicting assumptions like these. Let's talk a little bit about um, logistics, zooming out for a second. So if you wanted to wonder how should I get into CTFs if you haven't already, there's a little bit of stuff to talk about there. When you want to get into CTFs and eventually into a security career, uh, several additional questions may be floating in your mind. So, how do I make CTFs work for me? How do you make CTFs work for yourself? Kind of boils down to just two questions. How do I find a team if I don't have one already? A lot of my tips just boil down to finding people with common interests. Uh, my team of origin, Maple Bacon, it's a university team. So I'd wager that to be a good start. But if you're out of university or otherwise don't have a university team, um, it's important to just find a group of friends who just like hacking. Things like DEF CON CTF and other high profile events require a lot of logistics, but aside from that, the core of Maple Bacon, my team, was always a very simple one. We were just a bunch of friends who liked making memes and hacking things. It can be really hard to direct a group of people towards a common goal of, for example, winning a CTF when you treat it like a chore or some sort of stringent expectation that they need to follow. But if you kind of frame it as a group hangout, just a bunch of people having fun, the skills tend to grow a little bit more naturally that way. Speaking of skills, how do you get better? How does one get better? Again, the generic answer is still the best one available. It's really just a matter of consistency and praxis. But not just any practice. You want to be pushing yourself a little bit more out of your comfort zone, solve easy challenges, then solve less easy challenges, uh, and then go for more difficult ones, slowly and surely. Going back to art, one fundamental art lesson that really stuck with me is learning how to shade a sphere in a 3D space. So for people learning art, one of the most fundamental techniques that many artists in many disciplines will be using is being able to differentiate between your dark and your light values, your shadows and your lights. In the first couple of weeks, you'll be shading a lot of these circles, but eventually you'll be given a pyramid to shade and then a cylinder until eventually you can shade in more complex shapes and figures. So when you start, you crawl, then eventually you walk and then you learn how to run. But how do I lead a CTF team? For those of you setting yourselves up to play in them, maybe you're wondering what it means to be a good team leader. Again, general advice. Play to each other's teammates' strengths and weaknesses. Address those gaps. Figure out how to overcome them. But I can get more specific. First, don't come out of the gate expecting a bunch of people to follow your word as law. Leaders don't do that. At this stage, you should have a bunch of people all keen to learn something new and try out cool vulns and bugs. You won't need to worry or wonder if the people in your team are thinking about uh, their own skill development. Their presence in that team should indicate enough. Instead, your primary focus as the leader should be in confirming if each teammate has each other's back. If everyone's your friend, this step's already solved for you. But if you come together as strangers to play in CTFs, you should learn how each person interacts with each other as friends before becoming well-versed in hacking, which is a very long-winded way of saying, make them become friends. People learn and perform better in the company of their pals. The last thing you want is to make them feel like it's a chore to even participate in a CTF. I always play them for fun, and that's really it. 
<clears throat> to close out the um, CTF portion of this presentation, here are some resources if you wanted to look more into playing CTFs. Um, there's a lot more, but these are my favorites of learning how to get started. So let's transition into utilizing this algorithm for red teaming. Again, let's take a look at our three-step algorithm all the way back. Much of the core idea remains the same. We just need to modify the scope a little bit. So determining user input becomes initial entry. Your way of utilizing techniques is quite parallel to the usage of tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs for short. Um, and those will flush out the bulk of your red team exercise. Finally, you're still contradicting assumptions made by the application, but you're doing so to specifically counter a system security controls in order to improve them. Something that sets red teams apart from CTFs, I've noticed, is that while CTFs are neatly scoped to a specific exploit or chain of exploits, red team exercises have a way larger scope. You need to not only figure out how to exploit a service, but how are you gonna move from that service to another if you need to? What happens if you get kicked out of the machine? Do you need to stay hidden, or does it make more sense to be loud? Those are questions that CTFs don't necessarily answer all that efficiently, but I do argue that CTFs are still helpful in this context. So let's start at the initial entry point, fittingly. This is more than just figuring out what exploit to use against a machine. It's also a combination of managing your expectations to determine what to do or how to act under several different scenarios. It's not enough to throw an end day and call it a day. <laughs> Does it even make sense for the attacker profile you've created to use an end day? This is pretty important, as the goal of a red team exercise is to create a safe environment to test and secure an organization's security controls by emulating a real attacker. If the attacker you're emulating likes phishing their victims over memory corruption bugs or logic-based bugs, reconsider the end day. Anyway, what do you do once you're in? What's your goal? How do you get there from here? You should have a plan at the start to determine all of your bases and cover all of your edge cases. But once you have your initial plan, sorry, once you have your initial entry planned out, that should inform the tactics, techniques, and procedures that make the most sense to use. This is probably one of the more important steps of this whole strategy in the context of red teaming. This is pretty, this is pretty reliant on the attacker profile that I mentioned earlier, but it also changes greatly based on where you started with your initial entry. For example, if you wanted to test the security of your cloud environment, but your initial entry point was the stolen credentials of a, contra of a contractor who isn't involved with the cloud environment, you'll have to think about several additional hops to get from point A to point B. Those additional hops are, well, the additional TTPs you'll be using that craft the majority of the exercise. But let's say that instead of a contractor who isn't involved with the cloud environment, you compromise the machine of an engineer who is involved. Maybe they're part of the data center or something like that. Then you're gonna, they're, you're gonna be using a lot less TTPs um, because your initial entry has given you quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of a head start. Finally, we get to the last part. You've utilized the chain of TTPs that make the most sense for your attacker profile. Your goal should be in sight, and therefore the collection of ways you've broken the system's security controls are also in compilation. What's important at this stage is to actually understand the functionality of the system you're breaking at a level that allows you to properly test those controls. This is where the contradicting the assumptions part of my CTF strategy comes into play. If you have a CTF background, you'll probably already be primed to look for certain things in that system that that system's trying to protect, and the assumptions it's made in attempting to protect them. For example, when a company wants to store large amounts of consumer credentials, how are they storing the passwords? Hopefully not in plain text. But if they're using properly encrypted uh, passwords that are, again, encrypted, hashed, salted, peppered. Is the cryptographic system being used still crypto cryptographically sound? And who accesses the database? 
Is it just sysadmins or software engineers? Or was there a flaw in the ACL management system that allows other people to access it? These are potential oversights that arise from assumptions made when they were implementing these certain security controls. This actually has a name, threat modeling. I think CTFs can give you a really nice sandbox to test out how to properly assess the behaviors and controls of a system, and therefore better see these oversights that were potentially made in the implementation of them. So uh, ideally, when you're planning this out, when you're planning a red team exercise out, you create a giant graph of, with your goal in the middle, and potential scenarios and TTPs that make the most sense to achieving that goal. Broadly speaking, just create a large map around a central goal, data compromise in this case, and that map gives us a good idea of the paths that are available to us to achieve that goal. This also gives us a good idea of what sort of security controls we should try to break or what TTPs we should try to use. For example, maybe it makes more sense to start from a uh, phishing angle, steal some credentials, access a user's files, which is technically data compromise, or go further. Maybe you want to compromise a software engineer's machine. That also allows us to access their files naturally. But maybe it gives us access to a database so we can exfiltrate data from there. And you have all sorts of uh, techniques that you can use to exfiltrate that data. Finally, additional lessons, takeaways, closing lessons. <clears throat> so, like I said, I started in 2020 learning about security. And I'm not going to pretend like I know everything in this space. I very clearly don't. But it is worth pointing out that despite only starting four years ago, I don't think I would have ever expected being here. I don't think I would have ever expected working at Google on Google Red Team. I don't think I ever expected winning DEF CON 2023, nor did I expect winning DEF CON 2022, nor did I expect becoming number one in Canada for my CTF team, nor did I expect even playing in CTFs in the first place. I wanted to be an artist. That was my start. And yet in spite of that, it's never too late to try something new. It's never too late to pivot and say, you know what, I wanna do something else. And so if you're worried about, I don't know, maybe you think it's too late to play in CTFs, it's never too late. Maybe you think it's too late to pivot even within security, no. As long as you have time now, you have time to start. And probably a more broad lesson that I was showcasing throughout this presentation, a lot of skill sets just share the same sets of principles, and it's just a matter of patterns. Humans love patterns. We learn things easier when we can abstractify things to these base patterns, and you make it a lot easier on yourself when you construct these patterns um, and apply them in new contexts. It helps you learn easier. It kind of removes the nervousness from learning something new or trying something new. So I recommend trying to apply that base algorithm I've showcased in new ways. So let's revisit the question. <laughs> How do I win DEF CON CTF? Number one, it takes a couple of friends who enjoy each other's company to really make or break a team. And the team is really important. And before you can run, you need to learn how to walk. And before you can walk, you need to learn how to crawl. Start small, start now. Start with the most basic vulnerability you can think of and slowly work your way up. But don't rush yourself. And three, take an art class. It might help. And more broadly, after DEF CON, how does one become a red team engineer? Play CTFs. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. This has been a great presentation. You've been a great audience. All right, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Do we have questions? No? You're shaking your head. That means you have one, right? Okay. Should I ask you questions? I don't know. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite type of, uh, like, your favorite category of CTF challenges and why? Oh, my God. I didn't say I'm going to ask easy questions, so, you know. I really like web application security. 
That's kind of the category I started with. Uh, so for context, CTFs usually have five broad ca challenge categories, web application security, cryptography, binary exploits, low-level exploits, reverse engineering, and everything else, MISC. Um, web application security is probably my most favorite. Uh, I remember the very first bug that I found in the wild that I reported. It was a um, prototype pollution vulnerability. That's why I like prototype pollution so much. It was a prototype pollution vulnerability that allowed uh, users to <clears throat> that allowed users to run their own processes in a in a computer, which is uh, bad news. And I think the diversity of vulnerabilities that you see in the web application security space is what makes it so exciting for me and why I want to keep learning more about it. But no shade to the other categories. They're great. Makes sense. Do we have questions by now? Yes. I knew you don't want to hear my dumb question, so you're going to step up. So this is not a dumb question. So do you, okay. do you play mainly in the web category, or are you also specialized in some other categories, like Bone, and this is the question? Yeah, yeah. I've been branching out more recently. So like I said, I started with web application security, but I've been learning, for example, browser exploitation, V8, um, JavaScript compilers, things like that. And I've decided to go a little deeper, kernel exploits, hardware, CPU vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, was that the question? I might have misunderstood it. What was that it? I think the question is uh, if you play only web or if you branch out. Okay, perfect, yeah. Um, so the, uh, the slide that I showed about my UBC uh, academic career, uh, I didn't specify the major that I was studying. So at the time it was computer science, again to make video games, didn't work out. Um, but that did give me a nice avenue to learn applied math. So I ended up taking a math component in my studies as well. And so I've tried a few cryptography, RSA related uh, challenges as well, although um, I think anything past ECC into like the quantum or post-quantum era is all alien language to me. But yeah. More questions? Anyone? I, I do have another question. Sure. Uh, so you, um, your, your Super Smash uh, Brothers career unfortunately failed, but uh, which, which character did you play? Uh, which version of Smash? Uh, let's go for uh, the original. The original, I played Pikachu. Uh, Melee. Solid. Thank you. Melee, I played Marth. Uh, Brawl. Anyway, Smash 4, I played Zelda. And the most recent one, Smash Ultimate, I play three different characters. Corrin, Zelda, and Palutena. I see. All right. Uh, last call for questions before I stop asking dumb questions and let you get more coffee, I guess. Going once, going twice. My closing question is, do you like keys? I love keys. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Shem V. Paulington. <laughs> <laughs>